All right, what's up, everybody? We are literally sliding into this podcast oh. on brand new casters on our chairs. They were uh, we had a lot of uh, resistance, a lot of friction with our previous versions. I think MC did MC Ryan. MC Ryan went in and, and personally customized all of our chairs so that they'd actually move. Not new on chairs these new, on these just, new casters. Yeah, he figured out a way to do it. So uh, beautiful. You'll see less herky jerky motions, less, less of this awkwardness. Yeah, the trying. Vortex Nation pod- podcast is ready to slide into your phone. Yes, <laughs> they went they went over to Rifle Scope Repair, got some of that special grease they use in the razors. Mm-hmm. Super slick. Mm-hmm. Very mm-hmm. very slick. Now, as we dive in or slide into today today's subject, uh, let the record show show that I have a constant ringing in my ears, I believed to be called tinnitus. Tinnitus. Now, the reason why that's important, or maybe it's not important, maybe it's just a me issue, is because we're going to talk today. We got Jim here, of course. Hello. We have Ruben and Adam, resident experts on everything firearms, related to firearms, all sorts of stuff. And suppressors, oftentimes called silencers but I think probably more accurately called suppressors. Yeah. So, guys, let's open her up. Why suppressed? Why suppressed? Why not suppressed? True. That should be the question that we're asking. Rube, you kind of brought this up as you had a lot of thoughts on the matter, a lot of ways to explain to a lot of people that why they should go suppressed, you know? Why don't we... Suppressors are suppressors are an odd thing. So let's let's explain this for a lot of people out there who might not be as familiar with them, right? So yeah. for the folks on the uh, uh, in the industry and, and customers out there who are quite familiar with the suppressor world, you might know that getting a suppressor isn't necessarily as easy as just getting a regular firearm yep. or something like that. Uh, but for some people out there, they might actually think it's just completely impossible. Or, yeah, you know, and and that's one of those things. I think there's a there's misconceptions strewn about all over the world of firearms but really when you get into suppressors and nfa items in general <coughs> short barreled rifles short short barreled anything um you start to get like all these misconceptions where either a someone saw something in the movies that was you know misleading or you know for example with a silencer they would see it and it sounds like it does just on 007 right it's like this little pew well, that's not, yeah, that's not what they actually sound like when you shoot them most of the time. Most of the time, they're actually fairly loud still. If you're shooting with supersonic uh, ammunition, there's still a crack where the bullet is breaking the sound barrier. And, um, but, but there's just so many, like, there's so many pluses to it that it's, it's almost kind of like, why not? Mm-hmm. And when I, uh, about six years ago, I moved here from Wisconsin or from Minnesota, which at the time, uh, suppressors were not legal in Minnesota. So to me, when I moved here and I think I went to the range to do some, uh, familiarization with some of the Vortex stuff. Um, and there was a guy there that, uh, is, you know, affiliated with Vortex and he was shooting a suppressor and I was like, Whoa, dude, don't have that out in the open. Like that's not, you can't have that. And he's like, what? You're new around here, aren't you? Yeah. He was like, <laughs> what, what are you talking about, man? And I was like, you don't want to have that out. Like that's, you know, and it wasn't like it wasn't like one of the like a suppressor like the one I'm holding right now, which has a bunch of kind of fancy engraving on it and some, you know, official lettering. It was kind of just black and it looked like it was not uh it looked like it was older. So I was like the dude just like made this in his garage and threaded it on his gun. Well no, like he he's Out like of an no oil can or, or yeah, what <laughs> yeah, like a uh what you call it? Solvent solvent trap. trap. <laughs> yeah. And uh so I was like he's like, No man, no this is they're totally legal here in Wisconsin and Um, I've got like five of them and he proceeded to show them to me and kind of talk a little bit about what the process is to go through it. And then I I just started thinking like, you can have these. Why wouldn't you have them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whether you're hunting or just recreational shooting, like to me, there's, there's so, um, when you can get past all of the misconceptions and the way that the media portrays them and the way that they're looked at in movies and stuff like that, they're so dang practical. It's like, yeah. Now, by no means should you look to solely the Vortex Nation podcast for all of your legal advice. And we know that, for example, Ruben just explained how states can differ in their various different regulations and things. But yep. in general, in most free states, uh, yep. how would one go about getting a suppressor? 
Well, suppressor ownership with uh, to private civilians, um, you know, again, don't come to me for your legal advice, but assuming you're not a felon, suppressor ownership is legal in 42 states. Um, that means there's eight states where civilians cannot own them, and they're actually legal for hunting in 40 states. Uh, I got that information from American Suppressor Association, which is a really good resource on mm -hmm. learning about suppressors, how to acquire them, how to legally own them, stuff like that. Adam's actually an expert when it comes to filing paperwork on these items, so I'm going to actually let him talk. I know quite yeah. a bit about it, but he's kind of, gonna, he's a junkie. If we're going to run it down real quick, I was also I was in the retail world when they were legalized in Minnesota. Minnesota was one of the one of the later entries into into legalizing suppressors so i had a front row seat to when july 1st they were legal and there was like a cascade of paperwork um <clears throat> but basically what we're looking at is silencers have always been legal uh, what regulated them was the national firearms act of 1924 and if you're thinking historically about what was going on in 1924 they were breaking up the mob from from Kay. the roaring 20s or 34 excuse me um, they, so they were, that was a time where you could buy a Thompson, World War I Thompson out of a mail order catalog. And so they were like, well, you know, I mean, better probably, time. probably, you know, the, yeah, that was what they were, they were, the thought was, is like, well, Al Capone has Tommy guns. We don't want him to have Tommy guns. Yep. We don't want to infringe upon the second amendment because there are people that were still as adamant about that then as there are today, but yeah. they used tax powers. They said, well, it's not illegal, but you have to pay a tax. Two hundred dollar tax, which at the time was like a bajillion and seven dollars. Okay, yeah. so that number hasn't changed then. Correct, because Seriously. the Great Depression hadn't happened yet, so they had no concept of inflation. So now two hundred dollars is a, a um, you know a disposable. I don't know about it's nothing to sneeze at. It's nothing it's to sneeze not at, like, but it's it's an attainable amount of money. If you can imagine now if your tax stamp for a suppressor was. Twenty thousand yeah, dollars, yeah, me and whatever Jim, it is, you know. Me and Jim can use our economics degrees and right. say it with exact terms. Back then, it was a lot of money, and now it's not a lot of money. I mean, what's yep. what's a candy That's bar cost learned. at the gas station right now? Oh, I don't probably know, a buck, buck twenty. A buck twenty. Okay, well, a piece of candy, you know, in the twenties was like a penny, right? You know, so that so that that amount of money hasn't the the tax hasn't changed our our perception of the the yeah. tax the percentage of your disposable income is significantly lower now than it was then. So, right. so basically, don't tell the ATF that though. So basically, all all that is required to own one is to pay the tax, which is essentially registering it, and in, in registering it, you pay the tax. Um, so, when a manufacturer wants to make one, they file form one. Once it actually exists, they file form two. When they transfer between. Um, professional entities like like a manufacturer and a dealer, that's Form 3. What you as a civilian fill out are is Form 4. Oh, I always wondered what 1 through 3 was. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, so, so to take a little bit of very, okay. very basic approach, if you're wanting to buy a suppressor uh, as a, as a gun-owning, uh, Second Amendment-loving person, you would go to a gun shop. Yep. And that you, has their SOT, right? That's yep, what they need to have. Like they can't just be a regular FFL. Yep, they've yep. paid more tax for yep. for the, <laughs> the ability. Again, pay more money. <laughs> pay pay uh, more money to be able to sell what's these. The, what's the pay SOT stand for? Uh, special, special something tax. Special. Dang it, Mark. Uh, it's Sorry, a special something did. tax, but it's uh, we. I, we could I used look, to know it at one time. Yeah, actually. we could look it up. Um, but so you go to the store, uh, you decide. I want that one. And you pick one off the shelf and you look at it and you're like, this will do what I want it to do. And you tell the gun counter associate, which Adam will play. I'll be like, yep. Adam, I want to buy this suppressor. What do I do? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to need you to fill out this form. Uh, give me two fingerprint cards or we're going to make one. So special gonna... occupational tax. Special occupational tax. Thank Sorry. you very much. Mm. Interrupted. Um, you're going to submit two copies of your fingerprints. Um, because that's still analog, so they're going to take the best one of each of the two of your fingers. Yep. And you need two passport photos. And then you will fill all that out. You'll send it off to the ATF. And you got to pay the gun shop for the suppressor. Oh, yeah, you got to pay the gun shop for the suppressor. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're going to hold on to that while we wait for your paperwork to come back from the NFA branch of the ATF. So you can, you can go and if you find one of these proper dealerships, you can go and buy one today. Oh yeah, and you could do yeah, everything yeah. you need to do today. Yep, it, 
you're just not going to get the suppressor today. Right. It's right. going to be they're they're going to receive the suppressor. You can even, I mean, you know, like it's you can there. go and check it out, visit you can it, look, you can at, look it, at it through the glass it. and touch it. You know, <clears> a lot of ammo hands. ranges will let you shoot it. Like if it's a store that has a range, they'll let you oh, check yeah. it out and shoot it. You just it can't leave the premises yeah. until the ATF approves the transfer of that item to you. And when yep. they do that, they put a stamp on your form four, an actual like leaky postage stamp. And then when you get that back, that is your permission slip to travel about the country with, with your suppressor. Right. And then do you have to keep that with you whenever you have? Well, it's your permission slip to go to where you live and then in the state you own it in, right? Because if you travel to other states, you might so, have to have. Uh, suppressors you can travel without filing oh, okay. paperwork. What Ruben's referencing is the same process is what you go through to own a short barrel rifle. Short barrel rifles, you have to file an additional form to travel across state lines. Sure. Um, hmm. But you don't need to do that with a suppressor. You can travel with a suppressor anywhere in the U.S. that it is legal to have them, or you can, as long as where you're going, it's legal to have them, you can travel with them. Yep. One time, we took my rifle with a suppressor on it to the Vortex Extreme, and we rented a car that had California plates. And I just thought it was really funny that we were driving around in a car with <laughs> California plates and a gun that had a suppressor on it. I mean, that was years ago. Fun story. Yeah. Anyway. One Long thing, past, yeah. We weren't in California. Yeah. Are you trying to get me, are you trying to, like, get me on, on the statute of limitations yeah, here? Yeah, I'm trying to make sure you're safe. I'm good. Long one thing, time ago, forever one, ago. One thing I find interesting about all this, the paperwork and special processes that are in place is, like, when I look at a suppressor, to me, it appears to be like a firearms accessory, right? Yeah, like there is. Like there is a, not much to them. Like a rifle <laughs> scope or a... Whatever, but it's definitely not managed like a firearm. Yeah, it's like accessory. a muffler for your car. Yeah. Right. Like yeah, it, I mean, you, you know, by the law, like you can just buy a rifle scope. You also have to fill out the same form that you would if you were getting a rifle, right? Or like a, a, a yes. gun. Yep. You, you still have to need fill to fill that do, out too. You still need to do a, a Brady background check as well. Okay. Yep, 4473. So, all right. So we kind of got into how to acquire, procure a suppressor. So for those of you, again, out there who maybe thought, hey, this whole suppressor thing, just how, how is it even allowed or how does it work? Yep. Now, now, why suppressed? Okay. What, what were your thoughts on that? I, I, I want to let you take that away to, to start out. I, I think that they're so practical and like, and, and kind of like Jim, like our generation, Adam's generation, Mark's too old, but like our generation kind of tends to ask questions. You're well, geez, Mark, I'm sorry. You're not a millennial. You're, I'm sorry. You're not a millennial. Um, <laughs> Our generation tends to look at like how like these social norms have been like established and look at it and be like, well, why why that like and imposed upon us, mm-hmm. right? And so I think I look at it and I'm like, well, I've never broken any laws. Why why do I have to do all this stuff? But nonetheless, they're really cool, and so I I think I want to own them, right? So like you go through this process and you're like, well, when I go to the range. A lot of times, I mean, for me, going to the range is a social event. Like, I'm grabbing a couple buddies, we're going to the range, or do some target shooting, you know, sometimes get ready to go shoot a competition or something like that. But, like, what do you do when you go to a social event? You stand around and talk to people. Well, what do you do when you go to the range? You put on earmuffs and then earplugs in, and then you stand by yourself with other people there, but you can't really carry on a conversation. Without so, yelling. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously specialty earwear that you can get, but... um yeah, there's. I, I mean, to me, they're just so practical. Like you're, you have to run a muffler on your car. It's legal. Otherwise, you can get a fine for it because they're too loud. They can damage hearing. They can um, cause you know um, disturbance to your community or other you know people on the road stuff like that. So like you know, and you all we've all seen the like no Jake breaking sign, right? Like yep. you can't can't do. Yep. St- so noise is frat <coughs> folks. Frat parties get shut down all the time for domestic disturbances, right, Mark? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Old, old frat days. We yeah, just so a giant house suppressor. <laughs> Mark, you had a few of those parties at your place back in the day, didn't you? Some good times, Ruben. Yeah. Good times. But yeah, people don't like excessive. I mean, noise. people don't. Yeah, in general, like excessive noise. It's like why we're always trying to find ways. Unless it's 4th of July, we're always trying to find ways to decrease noise. Like, whether you're in a manufacturing facility, they're trying to wait, find ways to make the machines quieter. If you're um, building automobiles, you have mufflers and, you know, devices on them that make them quieter. Well, automobiles are a little different because I always want to make my car louder. Yeah. Yep. To a certain that, extent. That was always my joke is, like, if, you know, if, if the framing of suppressors was different, every 16 to 21-year-old kid would be cutting it off his rifle. 
yeah. until he was about 27, and then, right. then he would be paying more money to put it back on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that is it, it, very <laughs> accurate. <laughs> if every gun came with a suppressor, people would be chopping it up, yeah. It's one of those things where it's kind of hard to pick one reason why, why suppress, but because there's so many justifications in my mind of why to have them, okay? If we're talking about hunting, if we're, if we're out in the field, um, there's, you know, studies show that 70 to 80% of hunters don't wear ear protection. Mm-hmm. Um, I was definitely one of those people for the first, you know, started hunting when I was, you know, nine, 10 years old, um, where I grew up, you couldn't deer hunt until you were 13, but you know, we could, you know, could go out and get our firearm safety done. You could go and, um, waterfowl hunt, small game hunt, stuff like that. So you're standing in a duck boat next to all these guys shooting and, you know, no ear protection. So we get to this point where now I'm 30 years old and I have like over 30% hearing loss and that's, you can't get it back. Right. I mean, if you have vision problems, sometimes you can go and get LASIK or you can, you know, um, wear contacts that'll correct an astigmatism and stuff like that. There is no way to get your hearing back. I mean, to my knowledge, without absolute like major reconstructive surgery. Basically what you're hearing is, is there's, uh, hair-like structure they're cilia but they're hair-like structures in your ear and as they move as as the sound waves vibrate them that's what you perceive as a sound yep okay <clears throat> when you experience a sound that's the, the way they measure sound is, is a measurement called decibels when you experience a sound over 140 decibels yep. basically that stimulates the cilia to the point that they break off oh okay yeah and, and that's, that's what's called a catastrophic hearing event and that's essentially that like that you don't get it back. Like if you damage a nerve in your hand or something like that. I mean, that's just kind of the ache or the yeah. It will just it basically. Oh, well, it's basically like uh, like an audio device or whatever. You just like plug in a mic and just let it. There's no feedback into it. It's just it's just a hot mic and it makes that hum noise. That's what your ear gets, and they call that tinnitus. So the the ringing in your ear that is the cumulative damage that you've done to yep. your ears. Okay. And what people perceive as going deaf, they would think, oh, well, I'm not going to be able to hear anymore. It's not that the world gets quieter. It's that the ambient noise in your head gets louder. Yep. So I, I've done huh. enough damage to my ears to the point that I can't, I can't sit in a room and hear the hum of a light bulb or a refrigerator. Or even some point, like when you sit in the woods, like you used to hear that vacuum in the deep woods, like when the wind blows through. Can't hear that. No, that's I just get tinnitus. I've gone in like these. You, you can't hear that because there's a, there's like a ringing that's there's like powering yeah, it. Yeah, there's like there's like an ambient noise in my head that a that a that a natural an incoming noise has to be louder than that for me to perceive it. Yeah, mm-hmm. interesting. So like you you have you heard of like those sensory deprivation chambers where you go in like yeah they're in the ground but like you're in the water and then they close a couple of lids and it's like it cancels out all the sound. They had one of those in the in lacrosse where we went to school, right? Yeah. At the train factory. Yep. Because then they could figure out what was going wrong with some of these HVAC systems because they could hear. Yep. That so, was always what I heard. I never actually. No, that's true. Um, so I went, I got to try one of those things out, and it was at a trade show, and it was like either, I think it was in Vegas, but it was like in one of those huge giant centers where you walk through and, you know, like you can go in and try this out. And so I did, and like the ringing in my ears was so loud that it was painful. Like yeah. it, it hurt to be in there, and I was like, nope, let me out. This isn't working. I can't. I can't stand how loud this noise in my head is. When it when it's wow. super quiet, it, it's yeah. like it amplifies it. I think when there's just like you said, there's that yeah. ambient noise. Like you could kind of block it out. I think you just mentally ignore it, or you'd go absolutely insane. So that's why but, yeah. that's why but, people with tinnitus need white noise when they sleep. Yes. Yeah, like a fan yeah. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So they're could trying be. to hear that instead of the ringing. Okay. So nonetheless, yeah, you have these catastrophic events that permanently damage your hearing. So to me. I have uh, two little kids, and I want to be able to hear them give their, you know, high school graduation speech when they're the valedictorian, right? So, um, to me, I looked at like I want to protect my hearing. I want to, um, I want to make sure that I can preserve that for years down the road. The other thing is, you know, there's a lot of there's a ton of justifications for why you know why we would use one of these items. Um, uh, my professional career at Vortex here, well. I try to be a professional. Sometimes I don't quite always make it, but (laughs) um, what I do here at Vortex is uh, work with our dealers on product training and sometimes technique training and, you know, learning how to do long range shooting and stuff like that. But uh, a lot of times that's like either one-on-one or like 
one on a small group of people doing instructional shooting and how to use our products, you know, how to take a Viper PST out to a thousand yards or beyond. And, and so we'll, a lot of times we'll bring in a dealer and we'll get him set up on a long range and, uh, have four or five guys laying on shooting mats on the ground. And then, uh, me and, you know, either Adam or Nick or, um, any number of guys that go out to these events to, to work those. We'll, we'll instruct those people as we go. We always use suppressors because we still, we still, you know, kind of suggest that they use a little bit of hearing protection, you know, maybe some muffs on the outside or something like that. Uh, but we can carry on conversation the whole time that we're out there shooting because it, it's not overpowering. Um, and we don't have to have ear protection on all day. So we can, yeah. we can be carrying on conversations and especially, you know, we're out in the open field, um, laying on a shooting line, you know, it's not in a building or anything. So if we're out on the, on the field lane, on the firing line, and it's in a, a big open area with not a lot of walls or, uh, um, things that the sound can bounce off of back to us. I mean, you don't even sometimes don't even have to have hearing protection depending upon the length of the barrel you're shooting in the, the it, quality of the suppressor that you use. Well, yeah. well, and One. you think about it like, like that's your job, right? Like, you know, you look at anybody else's job where they're around a lot of noise or loud yeah. equipment. Mm-hmm. They're always wearing hearing protection, and yeah. actually, they don't have they don't, they don't even, have the option yeah, to required. suppress that equipment, right? They're required. Right. Um, just one, like we talked about, just one e- event, just one shooting event could damage your hearing permanently. You know, yep. and you get in a scenario like that where you guys are around it all the time, probably yeah. definitely more than average. Well, and, and think about it too. Like you, you're talking about shooting with people that. You know, whether it's maybe at a retail or you're not shooting with somebody who's brand new to shooting, but a lot of times you wind up going out to places where you're shooting with people that are brand new to shooting. Yeah. And 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 if you want to make shooting an enjoyable experience for somebody who hasn't done it before, the last thing you want to do is have a bunch of muzzle breaks and I'm getting like punched in the face. I mean, literally yeah. when you're mm-hmm. next to a nasty muzzle break, it feels like you're being punched yeah. in the face when it goes off. And that doesn't really make anybody want to come back. So that's actually a really good you know, segue into another reason for suppressors is that uh, a lot of the reasons why people will develop a flinch or develop, um, you know, a, a bad shooting technique or, or what have you is they're bracing for this huge impact. Mm-hmm. And I've I've done this a few times where I've what I've done just as kind of a you know my own little social experiment I guess uh, is I'll set up a firearm without a suppressor and I'll have them shoot it. And then I'll set up a firearm with a suppressor, right? Same gun, same well, same cartridge, same kind of loadout, right? But maybe in a different gun that's not suppressed. And I'll have them shoot both of them, and uh, I'll ask them like, number one, I'm watching how accurate they are with either firearm. But I'll also ask them like, hey, what, which one recoiled a lot more? And suppressors, depending on the model, can can. Um, reduce recoil. I mean, some of them, some of them don't. I mean, it's just a fact. Some do, some don't. But, um, I'll ask them like, which one, which one are you more comfortable behind? Which one felt like it kicked more? Right. Which one, um, do you feel that you were more accurate with? And, you know, you know, to the competition shooter, three gunner, PRS shooter, who oftentimes they're using a muzzle brake to really mitigate that muzzle movement. I'm not talking to you right now. I'm talking to the person who's getting into shooting. I'm talking to the person who's um, on the range using it, doing accuracy testing, whatnot. And they're, they're always like, oh, man, the one with the suppressor was way more fun to shoot. And so what we do here, a lot of times at Vortex, we're, we're hiring people, right, as, as the company grows or adding people. Um, we have sometimes we have people that you know don't have a lot of exposure to shooting, and so we'll bring them out and familiarize them with guns. And uh, we just took somebody out from our dealer sales department that didn't have a ton of experience shooting, and um, she was like, you know, I'm not super. I, she's like, I like the idea of shooting. I like guns, but like I'm not very good. And so we set her up with all suppressed stuff. And I had to drag her out of the range at the end of the, like, I was like, no, nope, yeah, yeah. we have to go back. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, no, you, work, don't, you don't understand. Like, we're done. They, there's 15 people behind us waiting to go, yeah. to come into the range and shoot. And, you know, of course we turn around and there was like a police department there waiting to come in. But like, she was so excited by the end of that time. She was like, I had no idea that it was going to be that fun. I, you know, realize now that I wasn't afraid of the gun's recoil. I was afraid of the noise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's a good analogy made. Um, there's, there's a, 
I don't know exactly if I'm going to say it right, but if I went up to you, Jim, and I said, you stand there, and I'm going to push you as hard as I can, right? And I just pushed you right in the chest, and you fell backwards a little bit. And now I, now the next time I do it, I push you, and an explosion goes off right next to you, you know, loud noise, same force. Which one feels like it's more catastrophic? The one with the noise. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So when we're shooting, preparing, you know, even I've uh, – I actually got so nerded, geeked out by suppressors that when I um, when I moved here to Wisconsin, the first year that I moved here, I was able to have my paperwork done and everything on my first suppressor, and I hunted with it that fall. And it was like I felt that by being able to hunt with a suppressor, I was able to make a more ethical, more precise shot. Um, I didn't, you know and this goes into yet another reason, but, like, I I didn't spook every animal on the property. Like, it, mm-hmm. it wasn't so quiet to the point where it was, like, video game quiet. But, you know, there's a little bit of wind going on. The wind was blowing in the other direction. I saw some other deer, you know, several hundred yards away from where I was. They just picked their heads up and looked and went back to eating. So it was, like, to me, I was able to actually make a more ethical shot. I didn't have to have my ear protection in Mm -hmm. because so which allows me to hear what's going on out in the woods better so you know i think you become a more i think you become a more effective hunter and a more ethical hunter by hunting with a suppressor too yeah well and you're preserving your hearing and now you talk about like you know hunting versus being at the range like when you're hunting that's like that's oftentimes an all day or multi-hour experience where you need to be able to hear you need you're listening for game or whatever noises a turkey gobble this that the other and when that kind of moment comes where you might need to take that shot you oftentimes need to be very still or Mm -hmm. calculated with your movements and one of those things oftentimes at least i know for me personally is i don't have time or i'm not willing to risk spooking that animal by putting my hearing protection in well and, and the other thing too is you know when in the past i've taken a shot and not wearing hearing protection and you talk about times where, first off, if you hit that animal, depending on where it is, you want to make sure that you know where it's going after that. It might not drop dead in its tracks. It might yeah. move a little bit. So you want to be have the consciousness and awareness to see what direction it went after it got hit. Mm-hmm. And if you need to put a follow-up shot on it, you need to be, again, having the consciousness and the awareness to, to be able to execute that accurately. And I've taken shots before where I don't have my hearing protection in, and you take a shot, and all of a sudden, it's like even your vision seems to go wrong because your whole inside of your head is your so scrambled. Your equilibrium gets, can get really screwed up depending you're, upon the firearm. You're so scrambled. There's such a horrific ringing sound in your hear, in your ears. You can't you can't hear anything. You know everything. Like if, if anybody's telling you something, it's kind of like you know it's mm-hmm. that real muffled thing. And and so if you're trying to then take a follow up shot or see where a deer's going, it's like when I did mine, I remember deer that. 240 I couldn't even see the deer everything was blurry yeah. my like everything in my vision was blurry here's something that comes up for me and and what I actually realized this this year um and I so what I realized was that oftentimes after you take that shot Mark or Jimmy or Adam like when you take that shot um you've been in a situation where you need to take a follow up shot on mm-hmm. an animal right um a lot of times you take that shot and all of a sudden the second shot, you're like all shaky. And like, at least I noticed that I get kind of like that panicked, like, okay, I need to take another shot. I noticed that hunting suppressed cause this year was the first time I needed to take a follow up shot. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like, I was calm, cool, collected. Like, and it mm-hmm. was, and it wasn't anything other than just this explosion didn't just happen. And I didn't just feel like this shock, to my right. face from a muzzle breaker from like the gases coming out the end of the gun. I it was like boom. Okay, yep, need to take another shot. Boom. Mm-hmm. It wasn't it I've always found that after like that first shot, my next shots are not nearly as effective as, as yep. my first. And in, and if you need a follow-up shot, that's probably the one that's more important, right? Because mm-hmm. now you're now you you have to put that so in. At that down. point it's, you know. Yeah. The wheels are in motion, and I hadn't thought about this aspect before, but I, I was in a scenario this year, Ruben, as well, when I needed to take a follow-up shot, 
you know, and you brought up the fact that it's not necessarily going to spook, you know, surrounding game. Yeah. Uh, and we we're in a scenario where there were a lot of deer out, shot, needed to take that follow-up shot. And game spooks game, right? Yes. So when one starts to run, a lot of them start to run. But if it's just one and everybody else is kind of like, not exactly, no, you know, it's going to differ scenario by scenario. Mm-hmm. Sometimes one room is going to clear everything out. No, and that, however, that I experienced that. However, though, I think it could help with, I guess, limi- lim- limiting that pandemonium, yeah. you know, where you may be able to get a better follow-up shot. And I'm going to throw one more thing out there that I thought of, and I'll say this saying, I've never hunted suppressed, but, you know, we're talking about that big explosion going off. And one thing that can be helpful, you know, I mean, you have to be, I guess you'd have to be somewhat close, but oftentimes in the Midwest, we're actually fairly close, even when you take a rifle shot, um, is being able to hear that animal as it travels through the woods. You might not be able to see it after the shot, but you might be able to hear it, or you might be able to mm-hmm. hear it crash. Well, and if your ears are ringing and yeah. everything's blown up, you're not going to have that. I've, so I've, I've been able to take about, it's probably 12 big game animals suppressed in the last five years. Um, and... I will tell you that every time I have done that, you can hear the impact of the bullet. Not like if it's really windy, sure, blowing away from you. Sometimes it's hard to hear that, but you can almost always hear the impact. That kind of thwap. Yeah, it's kind of like if you take a baseball bat and you hit a a rug hanging on a clothesline. Yep. Yep. Um, You hear that sound, which I mean, to me, lets me know that I that I hit the animal. That's important Um, information to have. uh, Yeah. So so. Ideally, you hit it and it drops in its tracks and it's dead on impact. Well, as hunters, we know that doesn't happen every time, and so the but but knowing that you hit that and you can tell after, I mean after your first time you do it, you can tell when you hear that um, the difference between hitting the dirt behind the animal and hitting the animal. It's literally like hearing a hydraulic impact. Um, yeah, it's the only sound that's going to sound like it's, that. It's the only thing that sounds like that, and so for me. That's the difference of like, okay, I didn't see any blood, but I hit it. So mm-hmm. I need to keep going in the direction where that animal ran. If it didn't drop right away, I'm going to keep following where I last saw it run. Um, and then kind of going, you know, hopefully you then pick up a blood trail and we're yeah. able to, are able to track down a dead animal. But, um, yeah, to, to, to further back your point about the pandemonium after the shot, uh, I shot two antlerless deer this year in Wisconsin that both of them were in bigger groups of other, you know, other deer and, um, both times. So the first time the one dropped absolutely dead in its tracks. And the second time it, the, that one ran up a hill and it died like 20 yards later. But with both of those, the other deer just picked their head up and looked and then went back down to eating. Right. So it, it didn't completely disturb the whole, uh, the whole herd. Right. Let me let me ask this with that as well. You talked a little bit about some suppressors um, reducing recoil, which I think that could definitely be handy on a first shot, follow-up shot, last shot, 30th shot at the range, or like you're talking about competition where you're, you know, sending a lot of rounds down range. What, what's going on there? One, on that, let's, let's at first, um, it ties into that, but let's explain what a suppressor does. Sure. When you when you uh, fire, details when you fire when you fire a gun, there's three three sounds stacked on top of each other that you perceive as a gunshot. <clears throat> there's the actual gun cycling, or or the action noise on a bolt action gun. That's not very much on an AR-15. Like the actual like slamming of the bolt, like when you just do that without a cartridge, that noise still happens when you shoot. That's part of what you hear. Oh, are you talking about when the when it cycles back and slams forward? Yep. Okay. You know, he yep. was explaining it for Mark. Yep, but that. <laughs> oh right, yeah, Mark. So on an AR-15, I've AR-15, seen it done. I've, oh, okay. I've seen it right. done before. Okay. Yeah, then we won't go into detail. So that that noise is about 114 decibels. 140 is this is the logarithmic threshold to start damaging hearing. And then, every 10, we should explain this too with the the, syst- the decibel system. Every 10 decibels means that it doubled in the noise. Okay. Oh, so 140 yeah. is twice as loud as 130. Also known as the Dewey Decibel System. Yes. Also known no. as <laughs> Screw Math. <laughs> the the other shot, the other, one of the other sounds that you hear, especially in high powered rifles or high velocity rifles, is the bullet breaking the sound barrier. So the bullet is going so fast that there's a vacuum of air behind it, snapping shut, and that that crack is is also 
in there. Uh, mm-hmm. If you're if you're really downrange, like if you've ever been in the pits at a high power match or been kind of in a position where you could hear bullets that were way downrange, still going on their way to the target, that makes that snap noise. That's that's the sonic boom of of the bullet passing through the air. And then the one that um, the suppressor addresses is when you fire a cartridge, you start the chemical reaction that starts building massive amounts of pressure. And that pressure has to get, it finds the path of least resistance, which is to push the soft bullet out the end of the barrel. When it gets to the end of the barrel, all of a sudden that pressure drops to zero because it's just all of a sudden it's just free dissipates into it. the atmosphere. Yeah. It's, like, it's like a champagne bottle. If you, if you shake up a champagne bottle and you let the cork out, that burst of, of pressure, that's what you hear as a gunshot. What a suppressor is doing is is allowing that gas to expand at a slower rate so it doesn't make the big pop from being unmitigated. It expands in several smaller chambers so that we don't get that that one uncontrolled yeah. So Burst. yeah, like you said, you just said chambers. So mm-hmm. it's not like this is just a big giant hollow aluminum just nope. trash can with two holes at either end. Right. There's actually like there's baffles in yep. these things, right? Yep. They look kind of like uh uh I don't even know how to explain them and what they look like. Um man. Well, and they're um, all different too mm-hmm. depending yeah. on the design. But yeah, there's but yeah, essentially a series of hollow chambers that the bullet is going to pass through. So the hole in the center is is through all the chambers, but there is dead space inside the suppressor, and that is what controls the sound. So when we talk about, it's not, you know, it's not movie quiet. I mean, it doesn't magically make the sound go away. We're just changing how how the gas expands, and so that that makes it like in um, in the case of a rifle, you know, with a muzzle break or something like that. It's a very sharp crack. Now a suppressor is going to make it more of a dull thud. Yeah, you know, uh, just just because it expands slower. Why is it that mu- I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you a little bit off topic because I have two questions here, but the first one I want to address is so why is it that muzzle brakes are louder than just a gun with a blunt end, no 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 uh, holes in it like a muzzle brake would have or anything like that? It's just it goes to the end of the barrel, it has a thread protector and just ends. Why is a muzzle brake so much louder? It's essentially the polar opposite of a suppressor. Instead of diffusing the pressure we're pushing it in a very specific direction okay to mitigate recoil so it's, we're using it like a rocket booster to kind of like you're kind of almost amplifying a yeah. lot of that force in certain areas yeah so oh, then it becomes, like you know kind of like a ninja like when they when they make that noise or they do the thing with their arms to kind of like break to, their like fall knock out yeah too bad. oh wait they're like when you get hit you know and they like throw their arms out to like regain their composure that's what oh. a muzzle brake's doing oh wow that was a really good analogy now I can totally picture it. Yeah. So like kind of that that yeah. Like, Whoa, if you're I caught, watching I on YouTube myself. now, you'll know exactly what yeah. I'm doing. I don't um, know how to explain it. It's yeah. basically a ninja for your rifle. Yeah, I mean if ninja gets kicked in the face and they kind of flail out so that but they don't fall over, that's that's right. kind of what a what a muzzle break. I've had like, a lot of Star Wars movies, a lot of the Jedi's when they get force pushed back, they do that right. too. You know? Right. I guess I'm picturing though, like standard firearm like Jim's talking about our standard long gun rifle. Mm-hmm. Like it almost seems like those or that force or opposing force, I don't really know how to describe it, but it's got two ways to go. Like yep. almost like front and back, maybe up, down, however that's going to yep. yeah, yeah. exhibit itself. But with the, with the break on there, mm-hmm. it's like... Right. Yep. Uh, it's, no, it's, it's doing the ninja move. The ninja move. Yep, the you just move. did it. Yep. So my other question then was... You know, you see, I've heard some people talk about, there's different, if you look at, if you're watching right now on YouTube, you'll see this table is full of suppressors. It's just NFA items. It's a, it's a stamp collection. <laughs> um, they're all different shapes and sizes. And I've heard some people talk about volume, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. so a larger volume suppressor is supposed to mitigate more noise than would a smaller volume suppressor. So if you see some of the, sometimes there's these shorty suppressors or they're, mm-hmm. they're designed to kind of be really nimble and small and mm-hmm. lightweight, they don't suppress as much as a really big volume suppressor would. Correct. correct? And that's because they're not allowing as much expansion. Right. 
um, of the be- gases. Because they all have different purposes. I think a lot of what you're talking about, too, it comes down to application. Are we trying to be as quiet as possible for a hunting application, like the one that you have on the on the teak on right, the table I, here? Yeah, That's I've a- got a this was a harvester, I think it is. Mm-hmm. This is a big can right. on the end of this thing. It also has a muzzle brake on the end, right. of it too, which is kind of like, unique. A lot of the application mm-hmm. for our law enforcement customers, the folks that I, I deal with, for them, a suppressor is... It's almost a safety feature. It's an OSHA type thing. These guys are going into a stack. You know, they're in a stack and they're going to take down a house. You don't understand what loud is until you shoot a gun in a enclosed space. Yeah. And so they're going to do that a lot. So th- what they're what they're doing is they're they're putting a device on the end so that they're mitigating some of that blast. So one, they so they don't all end up deaf at the end of their career. But also they have, you know, they're trying to communicate with each other still. So they have headsets on. They're trying to talk on radios and things like that. They can still hear all that while while it's going on in, inside the house. Right. And so different And they're trying to make sure that they're actually, compo- they have their composure right. when they're entering into a room perhaps. You know, and if you're getting absolutely, I, I kid you not, I've said it already on this podcast. When you get slapped in the face with a muzzle brake, I mean, it is like getting punched. Oh, it is a concussion it is a a Mm -hmm. punch to the face so a lot of a lot of law enforcement military style cans like especially this one so this one's made by surefire this is currently um what's issued or used by socom um not the quietest can on the market um but it it brings the blast down to that safe-ish threshold and then they also start to do things like um mitigating flash so how much flash comes out of the end of this Versus not um, on the they're first. They're basically like giant burning powder traps, right? And at the same time, too. Um, so part of what makes a suppressor work is is um, there's an, there's a phenomenon around suppressors called first round pop. So when yeah, the glad first you said that the first time you shoot a suppressor is most suppressors is usually going to be louder than succession shots because there is oxygen inside the can when it's cold. And as you shoot and heat it up and it's filled with um, burnt gases from propellant instead of oxygen, it's then quieter. So um, some of the things we get into is because oxygen is like a thicker or like it's a because it's denser. taking it is taking up volume in the suppressor. Right. Well, and oxygen is what fuels the burn, the uh, the combustion of the powder. Oh, so you're looking at oxygen not as like it, it's like a it's a thing in it's the suppressor that needs to be. Yep. Once it's removed. So yep. okay. can I ask this then? Mm-hmm. In a suppressor that has more volume mm-hmm. does it have a louder first round pop some do um it's a very specific a design thumb, characteristic yeah that hmm. that so like that's actually a, designed not to have as much first round pop. and that and that's something that people that companies will will advertise like this suppressor has yeah you know, okay best right. in class yeah lowest first round pop or something yep. like you that. you can cool. go yeah. pretty deep into the weeds on that stuff but some yeah. of that's what's designed um they're designed around those things for tactical applications or like this one's full auto rated. So this one needs to be able to take mag dumps in, in a combat situation and not melt. These things get super hot. Oh, so do they it, get mega hot? Yeah. yeah. Like this, this one actually started life tan, but it's got black marks on it because people set it on, on things that were black and then that <laughs> melted on there. Melt to it. Um, I've got a suppressor cover on mine. This is a cold tech suppressor mm-hmm. cover on mine over here. And, um, there was one time I didn't have it on there, yep. and it touched my leg. And yeah, there was a little bit of it took some of my leg with mm-hmm. it. But that one, that one is super lightweight. So push. that one, that one doesn't have to take a full auto firing schedule. Oh yeah, it's just going so, on bolt guns. Yeah, so they make that one out of a much lighter material, yeah. so that it's it's more wieldy for a hunting situation. Where this some, one's fairly heavy. Yeah, and I mean some of the materials that they're using. I mean steel, oh, yeah. stainless steel, aluminum. If you're talking about like the the stinger yeah. defense. I'll feel that one. Um, yeah, this thing is. You, they make smokes. them out of this thing is titanium, mm-hmm. Inconel. Um, there's yep. there's all kinds of different materials. Right. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, it, it really depends on what the suppressor is expected to take and what it's yeah. designed for. That one. No, one one can't simply. I'm looking at this suppressor here. One can't simply slap this suppressor necessarily on any firearm, right? Correct. So. You're talking about ones that are full auto rated, but then of course there are calibers, right? So yeah. I'm not going to mm-hmm. try sticking a 30 cal bullet down a 20 cal suppressor, right? And or a 22 or whatever cal suppressor, and then there's different 
applications as far as like you said full auto rated again yeah. but then also aren't rim there some fire suppressor rim fire aren't there some that are like uh what am i trying to say are the pistol ones different than the rifle ones there's basically the three Is three it? product categories okay. if you will we got rim fire suppressors generally characteristic they don't have to do you know there's not as much to suppress there and not as much pressure. Yeah. Okay. The other key feature of those is Rimfire 22 burns extremely dirty. Right. So right. you need to be able to take them apart and clean them. Otherwise, you'll just have like a big paperweight. Yep. Um, and lose volume in the suppressor, which mm-hmm. makes it less effective. When it's full of crap. Mm-hmm. Yep. You're going to get crap all over our table? Probably. Don't do it. No. This is. I'm not trying to. Don't, it just well, might it's going to happen. I was just going to no, see. Actually, that wasn't, too, not bad. too bad. That wasn't too bad. No, that's all stuck inside the suppressor. You don't have to it's worry about that coming out. There. Yeah, but you guys can look at that. So, yeah. Then yeah. there's there's pistol suppressors, which generally Here are suppressing a bullet that's not moving at supersonic velocity and pressure. Okay. But also they need uh, a little bit of a special mechanism on most pistols for the slide to work. Yep. Oh, the they need a little piston. Yeah, the little piston. They need to be able to kind of hang in space for a moment in time for the inertia to travel they back into don't, the slide. Don't they go, like, out or something like that? Or like kind that? of. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the biggest things that you'll see with that... Uh, what's that device called? It's, it's not uh, like a Nielsen's it's, it's, device yes, or something like it. that. Something like that. Uh, um, but anyway, so there'll be a spring in the mount where it mounts to the to the firearm. And so that suppressor, when the, when the gun shoots, that barrel actually unlocks, right? Like mm-hmm. if you take, like, a Glock, for example. Uh, if you ever pull the, a Glock slide back, that barrel goes out of battery and kind of tilts down, right? Yeah. Well, a lot of suppress- a lot of firearms do that, a lot of pistols. So they have that, um, so, well, and that actually happens in the first, like, half an inch of pulling your slide back. Mm-hmm. So what happens is they have a spring in the suppressor mount that so that when that happens, the suppressor isn't in, instantly... So really, so it doesn't bend right over time, because that suppressor wants to stay here while the gun drops down, right? So they don't want it to bend and break or have a baffle strike as that um, right. bullet leaves the suppressor. So. Yeah, and then yeah. you also extended the length of that barrel, so like the amount of energy it yes. takes for it to tilt okay. changes. So, so that Niel- that Nielsen device basically allows the pistol to function as it normally does when we change the dynamics of the operating system. Right. And then there's high-power rifle cans, or high-velocity rifle cans. So those are generally not user-serviceable. They're generally welded shut. Uh, You can't really take them apart. They burn so stinking hot that you never really have to clean them anyway. Um, But they're basically welded shut so they can take that extreme pressure, Pressure. thousands of PSI, um, and... um, and work that way, and then and, they and, usually take the amount of heat, and and they do take that, and then like what does build up in a in a center fire suppressor, um, at least is in, in what I've been educated on, is able to be kind of burnt out. Yeah. So much so, like your um, oven. Yeah. So do it. Do like an oven clean cycle, right? Goes up to five hundred and fifty degrees, and you do it for an hour. Well, so like I've talked to a couple of suppressor manufacturers, asking them like what I should do to clean it out, and they're like, number one. It doesn't really need to be cleaned out. Number two, if you're concerned about it, put it on an AR, do three mag dumps of 30 rounds into the berm or at a target, but in a quick succession, uh, you know, near 90 rounds of 223 within a, a minute or so of time is enough to get that suppressor hot enough to burn all that crud out. And again, they always <laughs> preface that with if there is actually any, which yeah. there probably isn't. But so you you know, so you don't have to do it. But if you really want to do it, here's what you should do. Man, well, that ninety sounds... round mag dump for uh, to clean your suppressor. What an inconvenience! Oh, seriously, it's terrible. That's what I was gonna say. That sounds a heck of a lot more fun than just turning the oven on. Yeah, clean. Yeah, yeah. So I was gonna ask Adam. Well, I mean, I don't know. I was gonna start transitioning a little bit because I know Adam uses his suppressor in competition a lot. Well, if which we're is kind of weird. If but... we're gonna pivot. And one thing more on the hunting side of thing, I w- yeah, I'd yeah. love to talk about. Yeah, want to stick in, yeah, stick in that triple threat. You know, that pivot foot. You can you can move in any direction. But right yeah. now, let's let's yeah. Okay, go for it. So, one thing that for me, you know, Vortex is, you know, we're really strong supporters of Second Amendment. We're also really strong supporters of public land hunting and conservation, preservation of public lands. Um, I think if you looked at public hunting and you were talking to somebody who didn't have a good experience or was against it you'd ask them you know like hey well why don't you like it you know a lot of the times that that argument would come up well like you know there's other people out there who are scaring game or making a lot of commotion yeah, and sounds noise. like a war zone out there sounds like a war zone you know if you got a suppressor on your firearm i mean 
the same piece of public land can now probably it, it's less disturbed when you have someone hunting mm. with a suppressor. So not only are you um, not scaring game as much because you're not using a firearm that's as loud, you're also not affecting your fellow hunter out yeah. on enjoying the same piece of land. People, Jim, people, and creatures that don't need to be any you know, don't need to know or none the wiser. Yeah. And Jim, and, can I, Oh, go ahead. Yeah. And I was just saying like, if there was, you know, there, there are horror stories of people who are out enjoying, you know, their, their rights to use public land and people who don't like hunting, hear the gunshots and come over and decide to drive up and lay on yeah. their horn and scare all the birds off the land or whatever, scare all the deer out of the way and let people know that there's someone there. So, yeah, cause that helps nature. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, I've been, I've actually had that happen to me. So, I mean, I can tell you that if I'm hunting suppressed, I mean, more than likely nobody that isn't within a couple hundred yards of me is going to hear me. Mm-hmm. Well, and that goes for ranges too. I mean, like, um, public or private. I mean, there's, there's certain facilities that we use for some of our uh, dealer and customer experiences out here. There's neighbors, around well if, if yep. all the rifles we're shooting are suppressed i mean you can still hear that we're out there shooting but it's at a, a much tamer level that the sound is much more dispersed so it it allows us to um, be a lot lower impact on some of some of our range facilities too yeah. and mm-hmm. that's also why we use them and going back to what you were saying before i mean that's why we use them on some of our our sales stuff too like when i when i go to a, um, an agency you know we're letting guys try this stuff it's like we can still have a conversation while three or four guys are, are shooting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, um, it's not, it's not like quiet. Like we can't, we don't have to have earplugs in, but we can at least talk and understand each other. So, yeah. well, and you guys shoot 10,000% more than I do, but I know when I go to the range and somebody rolls up next to me and they've got a break on their gun and nothing against brakes or even just an unsuppressed gun, mm-hmm. or if somebody rolls up to me and they have next to me, I mean, you're shooting in very close proximity to other people yeah. and they have a suppressor on their gun. I know who, I enjoy sitting by more and oh, who yeah. I appreciate well, more. And even you can be more accurate when you're not getting concussed every mm-hmm. time somebody pull, else mm-hmm. pulls the trigger. That's, sometimes, yeah, your accuracy isn't even up to necessarily you. It's just up to when the other person is going to take a shot. And we talked about that before, but I will reiterate that point, point. I'm a much more effective hunter, and I think I'm a more ethical hunter when I am hunting with yep. a suppressed rifle. Yeah. yeah. I, Jim, can I, I, I also just don't like to, I don't know, whenever I have, like, when I'm out shooting or when I'm out hunting, it's not that I don't want to draw a bunch of attention because I'm nervous or that I, I, I don't want anybody to see me. I just, I just don't feel the need to draw a ton of attention to myself when I'm using my firearms. Yeah. And if you go to a range and you're the guy who's got just the boom, boom, you know, that thing, I mean, everybody's going to be looking at you. Everybody wants to come over. Everybody knows what you have, which, you know, and it's like, I don't really like to be that guy. Yeah. What were you going to say, Mark? I was going to say, if, if I could semi pivot while still on hunting before your full pivot. Okay. I wanted to bring up other cultures or or regions of the world oh, like yours. Oh, yes. Yes. Where you did. Um suppressors are the norm and to my understanding if you're not using a suppressor you're looked at as kind of an a-hole. Yeah. Oh yeah, like they're all- how does that? I, I do either. Of you guys know as far as at least generally how that works overseas. I know like the UK is a is one where they're actually their gun ownership is not nearly as as free as ours, right? But Close. actually getting a suppressor is far easier. Well, yeah, and and they're kind of disposable um, because they don't have to go through the registration process that we do. So like when when you when we as a consumer buy these, you're pretty much married for life on them. Like you paid your tax. Like, if you pay $200 to get one of these, you want it to last a long time. Over there, they don't have to register them. They just buy them as an accessory, so it lasts a little bit while they chuck it in the dumpster, and then they can go buy another one. Yeah, you have a, you yeah. have a lot less invested. Yeah. And I do find it curious. You got, like Jim brought yeah. up, you've well, got you a, less extremely, time. extremely strict gun laws, mm-hmm. but a suppressor is looked at as, like... Yeah, and, like, the only reason that this stigma exists is a combination of the National Firearms Act and media... Movies. movies, media perception. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Over there, it's hearing protection. Over here, it's like an assassin tool. Well, and like I know what you're if, referring to, Jim. In in regards to, um, you know, like if you don't use one, you're looked at as an a hole. There, there are certain countries and certain regions in some countries in Europe, I know, uh, and in the UK, where um, suppressor usage in urban areas 
um, you know, especially with looking at like the population of Germany, it's an incredibly densely populated country with still some rural, but there, there's a ton of people there. And so I know that um, in a lot of those countries where they do have that super dense population, that's where we're talking about the suppressor usage being mandated because you're hunting in areas where there might be other people. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I mean, think about, and to the listener too, I mean, think about the area where you're hunting. Mark, think about where you deer hunt. I'll think about where I deer hunt. I'm never more than um, a, a half a mile away from a house. I mean, really, I mean, there's, there's yeah. very few areas that I hunt in Wisconsin or Minnesota that I'm more than a half a mile away from a house. Yeah, or some of these spots around here in Wisconsin, we have the Ice Age Trail. Yeah, you have people that are out walking their dogs in the Ice Age Trail. Yeah, obviously I mean, you're not shooting un- in an unsafe direction towards them or anything, but you're not far from them. Look at our local area well, and here, and you're less likely to interrupt their experience. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Look at look at our local area here. We have public hunting opportunities very close to Vortex. Um, do you want somebody you know out there without a suppressor? I'd much rather they had one. Yeah. Um, I guess I like the sound of gunshots too, so I can't say that <laughs> I, I don't. But I, right. I mean, come on, like it's let's look at the practicality of it and try and ignore these these silly misconceptions about them that they're an assassin's tool. Um, yeah. I mean, because they're they're still not quiet. They're yeah. quiet enough it's to protect our ears. Yeah. yeah, like you know, that's what they do. They're quiet enough to protect your hearing. When I was hunting this fall, um, my girlfriend and I were using 300 blackout subsonics with an expandable bullet, um, and she was about, I want to say she was about 100 yards away from me in her stand when she shot. So she's shooting a subsonic 300 blackout, a hearing safe bullet. Yeah. No, no ear pro required. No, no yeah. ear pro required. Very comfortable to shoot to the ear. A hundred yards away, I can still hear it. Yeah, like I was, I was still like, oh hey, she took a shot, and then text her like, did you get it? Like, I mean the the sound, the sound is still there. The sound still carries. It's just much more diffuse. Yeah. Um. So it's not again. It's like it's not like you're sneaking around and 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 nobody's gonna know you're there and you pew and you and you like take out this deer. But it's just like it was more. You know, it's more like it's more like slamming the lid on a dumpster or something like that. I you think know, the, it's, just, it's it's much it's a much tamer noise. I think the movies just grab the sound of like a uh, little like water spritzer like that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> essentially, you could also I just thought about this like you could use the movie as an example like suppressors make real gunshots sound kind of like movies project unsuppressed gunfire. And like yeah, you know, like, like they're a, talking, like they're having this big shootout in this bar, and like everybody's like, you know, there's like still talking, like yeah, yeah, like the the perception of a movie gunshot, like an unsuppressed movie gunshot. That's what it makes a real gunshot. Right, sound. right, right. So we're just really we're dealing with like movie scale sound. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, compressors on cameras. So <laughs> so all right, I'm gonna make this pivot. What's up with Adam? You use a suppressor in competition. That's kind of like you're you're not many people do that. Why do you do that? Oh uh, yeah, I, I explored it quite a bit. Um, again, when it was legalized in Minnesota, I was like, well, why can't why can't we use these? And, you know, there's some rule books where it's just against the rules. You just can't. Okay. Because the timers run off gunshots. The impulse of the gunshot oh, is what okay. tri- trips the timer. Right. So a lot of a lot of there are rule sets that don't allow them because it's harder to get an accurate score. Um, in PRS, it's very popular um, because of all the you know all the stuff we've been talking about. But there's actually like from what I understand, there's suppressed and unsuppressed squads. Like all the guys with cans, like that's what I've together. heard as well. I know that when suppressors came out and started to become really mainstream, like here in the last five years, I know that in the PRS, suppressors became instantly like really popular, and then. The guys started doing a little bit more research and realizing that like a muzzle brake still is more effective at kind of taming the gun down. It's crap ton louder, but um, if those guys are, you know, really trying to have that quick follow up shot and in uh, in a match setting, right? Or watch prone, trace or see where the bullet impacted. Any of that stuff. Yep. Um, then I think a lot of the guys, primarily most of them, probably still shoot a muzzle brake. But yeah, but yeah, I within still feel like the, I can do that better with a suppressor. I feel like, like the gun, yeah, like I can control the gun more because yep. I'm more cognizant of what's going on. I didn't just have a hand grenade go off next to my head. Yep. Yeah. So, um, I guess for what I use them for, um, like an in three gun, a muzzle brake still works better. I think we can say that definitively. Um, 
I have used suppressors before for a couple of different reasons. One, like all of my all of my personal shooting, like all of my practice shooting, like I don't I don't need to trip a timer. I don't I'm by myself usually. So this is actually my personal can. So I will and most suppressors, a lot of the suppressors we use mount over the muzzle device. So there are yep. muzzle brakes that are the base for a can. So I take my match rifle and I'll put this on so that when I'm practice shooting, I've I have a much more controlled report. Um, so that's where a lot of my suppressor usage comes from. Yeah, if you think about a practice session being like Adam and I's practice sessions, probably around 500 rounds of rifle if we go out and shoot. Um, whereas at a, in a match year stage might be 20 to 30 rounds of rifle. So it's like it's a lot more <laughs> beneficial to practice with them because you're running 10 times as much ammo, mm-hmm. 10 to 20 times as much ammo as you would in a match setting. I also tend to carry them around, especially because I shoot open, so even most of the time it's my option to use one if I want to. Um, if they put you in a confined space, yes, like if they want you to shoot out of a car or something like that, or lately there's been a lot of the uh, the big culvert like drainage pipes oh, eesh, that they man. want you to shoot through. Yeah. Like as soon as you see that, it's like... Yep, yeah, that thing's going on. You know, so now I don't, you know, it you know, a muzzle brake doesn't bother me when I'm shooting it normally, but when you put it in an echo chamber, it's like that can be distracting. Let, so mm-hmm. so me, I use it to mit- mitigate blast that way. Let me ask this quick because I'm sure that somebody uh, is screaming at the radio asking us why we didn't ask this yet. Oh, look, Ruben and I are playing suppressor pass. Um, when you stick a suppressor on your rifle and then take it off your rifle, what does that do to your accuracy? Do suppressors affect accuracy? Are you more or less uh, accurate with a suppressor, or and or can you take it on, put it, it or put it on, take it off? It's individual to the rifle. I mean, changing anything in the harmonics of your barrel may or may not. It's it's very individual specific to a specific yeah. rifle, which we learned about from the F class guys. Uh, yeah. If you watch a video, uh, our buddy Adam Riser that used to be with uh, Amtac suppressors. Okay, they did a video. It's on Amtac suppressors website. Uh, no, on their YouTube channel, and it's talking about point of impact shift with suppressors. It's actually a really cool video. It talks a lot about how there's this, like, my gun's more accurate with it. Well, my gun's not accurate with it, or vice versa, right? Like, my gun's more accurate without a suppressor. And it, what it boils down to is it has a lot to do with the load. If you're hand-loading, right, like you develop that load for an, uh, a node, an accuracy node, right, um, which is a, a point where that round now becomes more accurate and it's mm. these nodes are i'm not even going to p- pretend because somebody's going to crucify me no you're but good like, ian already talked about it on a podcast we did last time. okay good a little bit ago um so <laughs> if you let's just say we, we already well, know we which, already know yeah, yeah. barrel harmonics let's just say you develop a load physics without a suppressor and you throw a suppressor on a lot of times you might see a change or you develop a load with a suppressor and then you take the suppressor off, it could change. Now, there's always that chance that you have a load that shoots good or or you, let's just say you have a rifle and you buy factory ammo for it and you're out there and you're like, yeah, it shoots about a minute. And then you throw a suppressor on and it changes your harmonics to the point where now you're in a better mm-hmm. um, you know, point in your barrel's harmonics for accuracy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all of a sudden it shrinks your group down. You might... You might think that the suppressor is making you more accurate, but it could actually be that it changes the harmonics for that specific load of ammo. Yeah, and makes the gun more accurate. Or like you were talking about earlier, maybe you just shoot a little bit better maybe when you, you got just a suppressor. Shoot on that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I do. I personally do. Do you find that it makes enough difference in a competition, or that in like three gun, are you just shooting at no. such close distances? It's like ah, all I gotta do is. Not really. I mean, really what you're going to run into is is suppressor shift. So yes. usually you're going to have a point of impact shift between suppressed and unsuppressed. You may or may not, um, but it's it's something to know and account for. And then the um, some of what you pay for when you, when you buy certain suppressors is repeatability of that shift. So it's going to shift a little bit, but I know it's going to drop a quarter minute down. Every time. Every time. Okay. When I take it on and take it off. So that's, that's yep. repeatability. You also, have that to, you also have to think, too, about the, the size of the suppressor, your barrel thickness, or your contour. So mm-hmm. this is this Ruger American Predator has got kind of like Pretty a light, contu- light, light contour. Light, light Sendero, maybe, something like that contour. I'm not exactly sure what Ruger calls it. So you take this suppressor, which is 9.2 ounces, and you take 
this suppressor, which is like 16.8 ounces. Oh, yeah. What happens Can when you, you hang port, something like, on the end of something? <laughs> it pulls it down. <laughs> okay. Right. So, um, yeah, some suppressors are going to give you a, a, a shift that is entirely based on the weight of the suppressor pulling the barrel down, but they might have a really good uh, reputation of not increasing or not having any shift due to like the baffle stra structure. So like you might have a suppressor that's really good, like doesn't have any shift due to the baffle structure causing disturbances in the airflow, right? Okay. Or gas flow. Then you might have a suppressor that is not necessarily having the, the weight affect your shift, but it could have um, disturbances in the, the flow of gases, which cause the bullet to have a different point of impact. Hmm. So it really depends. Then, gotcha. The final thing that I use a suppressor for to finish that thought, uh, like Ruben and I are going to Expedition Multigun next week, and they have 10 stages of night shooting. Well, muzzle brakes are very well known for their Michael Bay fireballs at night. Mm, I will yeah. use a suppressor on my rifle at, to mitigate flash at night so I'm not losing my night vision, quote-unquote, when uh, when the big fireball comes out the end. This is going to control, because we're controlling the combustion as the bullet leaves the barrel, that mitigates a lot of the flash, too. So that makes sense. So concussion in conf confined spaces and uh, flash in, in low light is generally what I use a suppressor for for, for three-gun competition. Nice, nice. Suppressors are sweet. Yes, Everybody they are. should have them. Shouldn't have to wait eight months or twelve, whatever it is. I don't. Even, what is it now? What's the wait time it, at, ish at this point in um, time? time it was part? during its peak. I I waited, I waited thirteen months for this one. Um, they actually did make some changes to the system. They updated the way that they process the forms. I believe. I believe it was down to like an average of four months before the government shut down around Christmas. Okay. But I think they hit a backlog again, so I'm not quite sure where it's at right now. But it was it was definitely under six months, not that okay. long ago. There's well, a web it appears uh, that Ruben has pulled something up. What you got? There's a website called nfatracker.com, and I don't know any affiliations of the website, but that's just sometimes where I go to check on this stuff. Um, but what they do is... it. This website relies on users to go in and say, okay, I sent in my paperwork today, right? They go in, enter a date. Then they come back. Usually it's not too long when you find out your check has been cashed, mm -hmm. right? So you have to send a check, a physical check. Well, they're always it's, quick about that. It's the government. Yep. They take your money very quickly. <laughs> so so they, they, they cash the check, right? Let's just say you send it in on a Monday. And the next Monday you see your bank account got hit. So then the guy would be like, the first Monday, he'd be like, sent in my, you know, form four. Then he sees his check gets cashed, and he goes in on nfatracker.com and updates his little case, right? And, like, check got cashed the following Monday. And then um, when he gets his stamps back, he'll go in and update it again. Okay, so that's this website is compiling data that people willingly provide to it. It's not, not something that gets provided to them by the ATF. Uh, so I, you can see that right now it's probably like five to six months, um, between when you send in your money and check it's cash to when you yep. get your suppressor back. It's a long time. But I it's waited, a hard wait. I waited, uh, I waited 13 months for my first three. Dude, that's brutal. Well, what do you say on that note? We go into last calls real quick. Sure. All right. You want me to kick it off? Go for it, Jim. I'm going to kick it off. And I'm going to say that suppressors are hearing protection, and everybody should have them. Everybody, yeah. Well, it's almost like a universal last call. Yeah, I mean, how do you top that? Man, all I got is uh, after this discussion, really even before the discussion, this discussion, uh, all pluses, really no minuses. You know, you think of it as a almost a common courtesy. Would I would I rather Ruben when I'm talking to you or when you're talking to me, would I rather you yell in my face or just talk in your normal talking voice? Where I can still yeah. hear you. I still know that the words are coming out. I mean, thankfully Rube's not much of a spitter, but Yeah. I mean that could be um 
so yeah, you know, we spitter both, was full. S- spitter's full, Clark. <laughs> um, we both have kids. You know, we're talking yeah. about teaching your kids and shooting around your kids and protecting them and protecting their hearing. You know, this stuff just wasn't even a thing when you know, we were kids. Well, we didn't even talk really about getting youth involved. I mean, right? Think about taking kids out hunting, right? Yeah, or I mean, shooting. You're really yeah. mitigating an, an actual explosion that's taking place in close proximity to their head. Somebody claps their hands, it'll scare you. Yeah. So that's a great point you bring up about bringing kids into it. Actually, I've got. I remember even not not even necessarily these weren't kids, but they were just people that were brand new to hunting. I have some extended family that you know likes guns, thinks they're cool. Every time they come here, they want to shoot some of the guns that I have or whatever. But I remember breaking out one. I have an SBR with a pretty nasty muzzle break on it. You know the one. Yes. The thing is the flattest shooting rifle that. I've yeah. ever shot. I mean, you pull the trigger and nothing happens to mm-hmm. you, but you know, but you, your ears are destroyed. Yeah. And I remember that they were looking at that one, and like a couple of them were like, "Oh no, I don't want to shoot that one. That that one looks that one looks too nasty." And I was like, "I, I trust me on this. It's a lot nicer to sit behind. Like it won't it won't hurt you." And they're like, "No, no, I don't. That one's scary. I don't want I don't want to be behind that one." And, you know, then other people will go up and they'll shoot it too. And they'll be like, no, it's actually like really soft. It just makes a lot of sound. Yeah. You're like, no, I don't want to, you know, but it's like, yeah, it scares people away. Well, yeah. Mark, you remember that, that, um, that project we did with Rev, um, Rated Red mm-hmm. last spring? Yeah. Right. Uh, the Geisley rifle that was in that, I believe it was a 260 Remington. Um, but, uh, when, when we were kind of between takes one time, John Teagan's kid, I believe, I believe was somewhere between eight and ten years old. He was shooting that with a su- with a suppressor on it. You know, that's awesome. that's awesome. I think, and it wasn't it wasn't intimidating for him because there's there's none of that concussion around it. Yeah, not, not to hijack Mark again, but like just to build off of what you were saying, Jimmy. What's funny and and what makes me like question why we have to do what we have to do for suppressors is that. Every time I take out someone who's new to shooting, new to guns, new to shooting, and we have suppressors on guns, they ask, why don't they all have them? Yeah. That's literally what they say every time. Like, why doesn't that one have one? That's dumb. Yeah. Yeah, they actually look at the ones that don't have suppressors as, like, inferior. Yeah, they're like, that's stupid. Why? And and then I go (laughs) in to explain, like... Why why they don't? I'm like, well, you know, I we have suppressors here for work when we're doing work purposes, right? But if I take somebody out on my own, I'm using my own, and I don't have enough suppressors for all of my guns. Right. So when I say, like, uh, well, you know, I don't have enough, and they're like, well, you have all these guns. Why don't you have suppressors for all of them? And I have to explain what we have to do to get them. They're like, well, that's dumb. Right. Yeah, th- I mean, you're talking about a new shooter that yeah. instantly sees – the practicality yeah. and the benefit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mark, you like your last calls. We kind of hijacked yours. Well, you want to give another like three or four minutes? Actually, just to make well, up I, was, I was almost even going to say, <laughs> like, I liked Ruben's little wrap up there. I wasn't even going to add to it. But now, since you've invited me back into the conversation, I was just going to give a little anecdotal story. Now, this is actually took place with a shotgun, but um, I was. They make with, those now. They Well, yeah. Yeah. So you can get them for your shotgun, too. But I had, uh, m- my wife was out. I was watching the kids for the afternoon. Jeez. It was a weekend. And I said, oh, yeah. uh, let's go for a nature walk, which uh, to me, going for a nature walk was going to the uh, uh, piece of public land that's pretty adjacent to my house. And walking with the kids, I bundled them up and brought my shotgun with because of that little nature walk area happens to be um, perfectly placed be- between a kind of a, a roosting feeding pattern of the local uh, goose population. Oh, I know this story. And so I... Uh, as uh, not a good outdoor dad, I didn't... Ha- well, actually, you know what? I brought muffs for the kids, but they're young. They weren't staying on. We we're getting towards the end of the day, and then the geese started to fly. So I got what I thought was a safe distance away from the kids. I said, hey, stay put. Sit over here. The geese go, are coming. Go wait over there where I can't see you. You know, I was about 20 yards <laughs> away, and uh, I shot at, at, a, at a group of geese as they passed over, and... Uh, and then I looked over, and both my kids were crying and saying too loud, Daddy. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've ruined my kids for 
hunting for the rest of my life. And, and probably the, the worst part of it was I, I didn't get a goose, Jim. But um, worse than making your two little princesses <laughs> cry. <laughs> mm. No, but like I felt yeah. horrible and I was like, yeah. okay, n- number one, like if we go out again, like we definitely have to have hearing protection. But it also made me think of, you know, deer hunting or any other sort of, um, and I'm just like, man, like a suppressor would just like really mitigate that ever oh, happening. Yeah. Mr. Adam, you want to go into uh, your last call? That was a good one, Mark. I guess my last call, I mean, I work, good I work with the, uh, the, the government side of things, so military law enforcement guys, and they a lot of times have the same hurdles slash objections to using suppressors for their applications that civilians do. They're, they're worried about, you know, militarization of the police and the public being upset and why are we sneaking around and assassinating people. And for all the, the benefits that they really have for um, – decreasing liability and um, protecting, you know, protecting the officers themselves and, and allowing them to communicate and things like that. Um, I, uh, I just, I would encourage, you know, if, if departments are out there thinking about, um, you know, updating carbine systems that suppressors really are, they're gaining a lot of popularity in law enforcement. And I think um, most of the objection to them in that arena is, is based on fallacy more than fact as well. So, um, my, my last call there is is um, you know if you're fighting the good fight uh, to get them issued in your department, there's a lot of a lot of good information out there for those applications. And you can call well. Adam and John here in Mill Alley Sales, and we'll come demo guns with Vortex Optics with suppressors on them. Absolutely, got a big collection of them, and we'd be glad to come on out. So you can you can hit us up at GovSales at VortexOptics.com, and we'll come out and shoot suppressors with you guys. Bam! Nice, nice. We like to save our commercials until the very end. <laughs> this podcast is sponsored by Vortex Optics. If you couldn't already tell by the name and by the people who are on it. And oh, anyway. yeah. That's, Sorry, Jim. That, that's not even a commercial. That's just offering no, a service. That's my so bad. Some good info. I no, threw that good. one in there no, without well, asking. We're at the end here. MC Ryan's, non-consensual. Letting, MC Ryan's letting us we're know. We're creating a rare experience. There you have it. Rube, do you wanna, did you, you had a good one. Do you want to just close it out on a good one-liner, a good Rube one-liner? Okay, I got one other thing. Okay, <laughs> do it. Uh, yeah, so so the the biggest thing that I see with people is um, when 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 you're a, when you're a believer in something or a fanatic about something or you're just really gen- in general just downright excited about something. I'm I'm excited about suppressor usage. I'm excited also about competitive shooting and stuff like that. So when I, whenever I'm trying to get someone else in to see the light, quote unquote, right. It's not necessarily about trying to get them to see the positives of it. It's about trying to say, like, to, to try and get rid of the excuses that people have to not do something, right? Like, okay. oh, I don't want to get up and work out because I'm too tired, right? Like, get get rid of excuses. So the biggest excuse that I see with people in suppressor ownership is like, ah, oh, man, I just really don't want to wait that long. I'm just going to wait until, you know, they're legal and then I'll get one or whatever, right? <laughs> and so it's yeah. like... That that's the biggest thing is like ah, I'm not going to get one now. I don't want to wait that whole time. And then and then I go home um, and talk to that same buddy a year later. I'm like, yeah, man, you should get one. He's like, yeah, you know, I will. I probably just wait till uh, wait till they're legal. I don't want to wait that whole time. And then I see that person again, you know, six months later, another year later, and same same thing. By the time we, so finally I said this to a friend the other day, and he was like, yeah, man, I really want to get one. I was like, dude, since the first time we started talking about this, and you picked out which one of mine that you like, and you said you would go to a local gun shop and buy it. I said, you could have had the paperwork done four times. And he was like, oh, yeah. And so he texted me the other day, and he's like, yeah, I just went and did it. Because, nice, cool. nice. Good. So, so that's, that's kind of the thing for me is, like, you can sit there all day and make excuses, but if you want to do this, just jump in and do it, mm-hmm. like anything, like the Vortex Extreme, like shooting three-gun, like whatever. Don't, you know, the whole paralysis by analysis thing, just get over it. If you want to do this, just do it. And six months is going to, it's going to be, you know, six months from now is March, April, May, June, July, August. You're going to have this thing before hunting season. Okay. So True. that's Hunt. my last call. That was a good one. I like it. Get canned. Straight get canned. Up. Hashtag get canned. We're going to start a new hashtag called get canned. Um, I am not going to ruin Ruben's awesome last call, but I am going to try and cover our butts once more and say, that by no means is this podcast intended to be your legal source for advice regarding suppressor ownership in your particular situation. You should always check out 
what your state has to say about what you're supposed to yep. do. There's lots of good information and, out there. Uh, lots too. of good info out there. Uh, Rube, you mentioned one earlier on. What was it? The suppressor? I, our uh, NFA tracker. Check out, uh, American Suppressor American Asso- Asso- Association. American Suppressor Association. Check them out. Uh, figure out any any small little variances that might be different from from your area than, than ours. And, of course, we are not lawyers. So, uh, you know, anyway. Uh, yeah. We'll say that, and then also, if you guys have any other topics that you're interested in hearing about from the Vortex Nation podcast, please let us know. You can hit us up at Vortex Nation Podcast on Instagram, uh, or you can really just hit us up anywhere. There's there's lots of avenues to get to us. So, with that said, Rube, sorry to ruin your last call there, but if you check this out on YouTube, there's suppressors everywhere right now on this table. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye. 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 All right. That'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.